Um, welcome to another episode um, of the Wamadai podcast, and I'm privileged um, to be joined by one boy, Camilo Colomo, um, a dear friend. Actually, we were talking we were talking before the show, and we've actually known each other around ten years. Um, you know, we met at the I Hub, and one boy is you know is an interesting artist um, in the sense that she does. Um, you know, I mean, things differently. She tends to, like, explore, um, you know, art, you know, in an, you know, in an abstract way. I mean, I mean this is coming from someone who writes <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, spoken word and that kind of thing. Um, but I think um, the project that I can remember um, is one she did about... Um, uh, the Mau Mau, I think it was a it was a remembrance, you know, sort of sort of like trying, you know, trying to sort of, to, you know, to sort of um, remind us, you know, about the Mau Mau, the women, um, you know, and all those struggles. And I'm happy that she's here. And obviously, we're going to unpack, you know, her creative journey, how where she started from, etc. But before that, one boy, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Hi. one boy, as you already said. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's interesting that yes, we were talking about um, when, how we met. I asked you, how did we meet? And um, you mentioned that it might have been through iHub. Uh, yeah. I started off. I've done very many things in my life, and yeah. one of them was being a techie. Um, and so I think I met you when you were a poet, and you met me when I was a techie. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I mean that that's a that that's really cool. And. When did the transition, you know, from that, from being a techie, you know, to, to this, to this happen? Or how did, I mean, how did your creative, um, you know, journey start? I have always been creative. Um, the problem is that I have not always had the support to be creative. Um, I remember when I was a teenager and I was asked what I wanted to be, I said I wanted to be a photographer. And my mom made a joke about it. She said, oh, you end up being like one of those guys that Yaya who stands there and is like, well, ks, 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 can you forget pizza? <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. um, how, 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 how do you think your degree has, has sort of like informed your creative work? Because when, when I think about it now, I mean, I see very many parallels uh, between your creative work and what, what you actually studied. So it's, it's interesting because it's, it feels like, looking back at my life, it feels like what I, the, the experiences that I had, the, the research, um, the, the focus on women um, in the developing world, the focus on Kenyan history, specifically between 1948 and 1956, all of these have informed what my artwork is now. I'm so the ability to do research, to question, to write, to dream, to map out a particular project, that applies to my current artwork. So I do something called installation artwork. And, you know, I've been told before that maybe I should find a new name for it because it's, it goes beyond just being a simple installation. And my work takes about a year or so to create but it's more about writing, about thinking, about questioning, about moving pieces around. And I always say that the easiest part is putting the show together. The hardest part is moving from the grand idea and stripping down all the necessary parts and then putting it into a way that other people can understand. And that takes a while. That's interesting. But a year? Yes. What? I love the idea of memory. So part of my master's degree was looking at memory and violence, how we remember um, in uh, events, um, especially events that are related to violent activity. And so I like looking at how people remember, and I love digging into experiences that will pull you from your memory and place you within that particular space and create a new memory, which you can't really do, I don't feel I can do sufficiently on a 2D. And in the process of that, I found out that in Nairobi, we don't waste anything when it comes to hair. So the first iteration is, you know, you buy this weave, it's expensive, and you put it and you use it maybe one, two, three times. Yeah. And then it's resold to somebody else who reweaves it with other parts that have been collected from other hair weaves. And by the end of the process, it ends up being the stuffing of cushions and couches. How so, about that? <laughs> <laughs> so I found that pretty interesting. And I, yeah. I, I think the piece itself actually does speak to the resilience of 
Kenyans and the, the hustle that we have just by virtue of the process by which this hair travels. Did you take into account the fact that some people actually have their weaves stolen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like there's, there's a whole microculture around... Yeah. Do you think, um, you know, that there needs to be a bit more um, space or rather a focus um, on creativity as... Um, you know, as something that is important in the school system. So it's, it's interesting that you say that art and, art and craft is no longer being taught in schools. I think with the new curriculum, there is a reintroduction of art and, and craft. Now, you mean CBC? Yeah, with CBC. What I question is the quality of what is going to be taught. Because there is, you know, can you teach... Um, can you teach pottery, for example? Um, let me see. I'm trying to look for the best example of how there, there's, okay, there's definitely going to be disparities on how arts and craft is taught in major cities versus how it is taught in rural areas. Oh, it is, yeah. First of all, do you have enough art teachers? Are you willing to pay specifically for art teachers if you are in a rural area and your choice is between an art teacher and a science teacher? Um, and then, the, the other thing is, it has enough research been done around art in the country so that our examples are localized examples as opposed to uh -huh. examples yeah. like Picasso and Van Gogh and et cetera, et cetera. It's yeah. great to know about that. But case, yeah. the other part that needs to happen here is we need to, um, I guess, put our artwork into classifications in a way that can be studied, um, in a way that curriculum can be developed from. Um, so, can art be studied in university, art history? Can an art history be studied in university? Um, and then can that inform content that will be taught to children from an early stage? Um, there's so much around it that important structures that are missing. That, and this is why I keep saying what we need is not support, but investment, investment in these structures. Yeah always concerned when people say to support art. The, the art industry is currently coming out of a season which was heavily funded by donors. So heavily f f uh, founded along particular agendas, whether it was um, democracy or voting elections or uh, FGM or women's rights. Those particular agendas drove a, a, a chunk of what art was created um, from, say, the, the mid-90s to the early two, 2000s or so. And so when we say support art, it makes it seem as if artists are not working, that they're not making money out of their work. And so you need to support them so they can continue to do this thing that has got no economic value. And when you relegate artists to a place where they have got no economic value, then they've got no say in policy making, they've got no say in thought, they've got no say in anything except that they're begging, they've got begging bowls. And you strip the dignity of that form of work, which is important work. For an artist to create an artwork, there is thought that goes through that. And I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, actually, Esther Giuliani, and we were talking about how the artist industry, whether it's being a musician or being a, a fine artist, is presented as needing support. And what that means for, um, for the development of an economic backing behind that or the policies that are needed to drive. What challenges have I encountered in my creative line? Um, space. Space is a big one. Um, I would ideally love to see uh, more, more spaces for artists to create work because, okay, there's something called patient capital, which would be investment in an idea, not to gain the profit immediately, but for it to grow. And I think there needs to be patient capital where it concerns artist spaces. The one thing as an artist that you always need is space to create. Rent prices in this city are ridiculous. Astronomical. Yeah. Astronomical. And if you're, you, what you're making is not going to make you money in the next month, and you're not exactly sure when it's going to make you money, then thinking about 
getting a space to create it, it's, it's limiting.